One, two, three. Welcome to Skelta. My name is Joe Austin. And let me remind you, if you've just joined the show, Skelta is a joint production between Falcha Fierce to Hear and Fail on Fubble. My guest today is uh, someone who has a very uh, deep understanding and a very, a very defined view of where, in this world that we all share, we live in, where we need the direction we need to travel. So it's Dr. Peter Dorn, who is a lecturer at the Law Faculty at Queen. So Peter, welcome to Skelta. Is it an exaggeration? And, and, I, and I've looked and I've read your book, which will come on to in a wee way. But is it an exaggeration to say that there is an urgency around the advice that you're giving us all? Okay, well, um, I suppose I'm, I'm tempted to say that uh, the urgency is around the issues. I, I wouldn't want to promote my own advice uh, <laughs> in a way that uh, would overstate things. Um, we, I mean, there are, there are different perspectives, but what's interesting at the moment is that there is a consensus globally um, uh, among the, uh, I suppose the, both the, the movements for ecological liberation to address the ecological emergency, yeah. the climate justice emergency. There's a, there's a consensus across the movements and a growing consensus in the science and among the academics that these are issues that we can no longer ignore, that they are the most urgent issues and they will frame everything that we do from now on. So yes, politically, um, these are the signs of the times, if you like, as the, uh, the liberation theologians just to describe the, the great questions that uh, matter both existentially for our, our moral lives, our individual lives, but uh, for our lives collectively and politically as well. Before we go into those issues, which of course is the whole purpose of our interview this evening, tell, tell me a bit about you. So who, who is Peter Dorn? Okay, well, I, I, I sometimes um, refer to myself as the original cross-border body. Um, I, uh, I was born in Donegal and uh, in Mount Charms, um, spent a couple of years there. Um, but then um, uh, I was adopted and uh, moved across to Derry and raised by my wonderful parents, uh, Tony and Anna in Craigan. Um, so I, I suppose I uh, have a, a deep sense of uh, belonging to the island, um, but someone who has always moved between worlds and having uh, grown up in Derry and in Craigan in particular, um, during the uh, late, uh, mid to late 60s, those were formative uh, years in my childhood. I have a deep sense of uh, moving between worlds and, um, and understanding that, uh, that our personal and family and political lives are inseparable. The uh, conflict uh, impinged uh, on our lives as individuals. I had early experiences, I suppose, of the traumatic impact of the, the conflict for my father in particular. Um, so the, that's, that's a very big part of uh, who I am. I have a sense that our lives are deeply informed by geopolitics, if you like, that geopolitics always suffuses, even if we don't always recognize it, it always suffuses our worldviews and our choices. Um, so I grew up um, in Craigan um, with my uh, brothers and sister, and uh, I... I would say the household, my father's influence was internationalist rather than nationalist. Okay. Um, we were very, very uh, alive to the, the the struggles for liberation across the world. Um, our, as Catholics, we were more informed by liberation theology traditions, the the notion of political spirituality rather than a separation of those two. Um, and uh, I guess the, the, the project of uh, civil rights and the project of liberation uh, informed and uh, had a, a massive impact on the, the family's experience and the family's choices um, as uh, it impacted on our lives as well. You say you grew up in a Catholic environment. Um, 
were you would you describe yourself i mean was it a, a catholic influence what were you kind of uh, were you within the church were you were you above or beyond that um, I've always had a, a deep interest, but a critical interest in spirituality, yeah. and some would say even the the, the mystical uh, traditions within the church. I had an uncle uh, who was a big influence on me, who um, exposed me to Zen uh, Buddhism, yeah. um, even to some Hindu teachings and his, Hindu dialogues with Christianity. And then my father always uh, had some readings on liberation theology. So my, um, my experience and deep inquiry um, as a Catholic uh, were, was always informed by um, a much wider set of interests than the, uh, the parish or the, the Roman Catholic tradition. Um, I've always had a, a, a suspicion that the Irish Catholic Church in particular was really uh, um, a continuity with the imperial and colonial experience rather than one that might ever offer a source of liberation or enlightenment. So I always look beyond as well as within uh, the tradition and usually um, had an, inter an interest in the teachings of the orders, the Franciscans, uh, interest in the Jesuits rather than the uh, um, some of the the more parochial interests that uh, would have been on offer in my local parish, but like that. I, I would imagine now, and this is no reflection on the Craig and our dairy for that matter, I would imagine there aren't too many law lecturers that come out of the Craig and, um, had Where were you educated? In Derry City? Yes, I, I was um, educated. Um, I, my first school was the Holy Child in Craig and, um, I spent a few years in St. Columns College and then and I finished off my exam, uh, uh, exams in the uh, Northwest College of uh, Technology. So I left school relatively early um, after doing some O-levels um, and then uh, pursued, went straight into the Derry Journal and uh, my first career, uh, it, it feels like a lifetime actually, my first uh, uh, life experience and lifetime was in uh, local journalism and then began to do a little bit of uh, broadcast journalism as well. So I an interest in, in radio, for example. Um, so my uh, education, uh, when I think of education, I think actually of the experience at the Derry Journal. That was my political education, uh, meeting the local politicians, beginning to understand the lives of uh, local people, how the conflict uh, was impacting on local lives. I always remember whatever I did, you know, we often got into homes talking about housing uh, complaints or maybe events around the conflict. As I left to homes time and time again, uh, the mother of the household uh, would have a quiet word in my ear as the local reporter and talk about her nerves, mm. you know, the, the, the the, the, the deep trauma really that was working through the lives, no matter what the the the, the issue might have been, um, there, there was a deep sense that something was happening here. So there was a deep, deeply troubling uh, experience that was uh, going to take generations to to overcome. On top of the the the, the, uh, the more topical political uh, challenges, it, it's kind of clear from reading the book, which we're going to come to anyway. But uh, and I know you're not attempting to promote the book it's me that said uh, that will recommend the book which I, I do you you refer back or you refer on many occasions to the spirituality of zen buddhism for instance and mindfulness and you make that connection between the well-being of the individual and events that that engulf or impose on their life sometimes without their consent were you a, were you a serious young man were you a, were you a, a typical reporter weighing women and Whatever else, so on, I suppose. <laughs> well, um, my yes, I, I guess the, the, the word serious uh, was uh, often used um, or intense in some way. And uh, I remember my, my mother would often uh, describe me as rather serious, but I, I think in some ways she, uh, she, she was trying to tell me to uh, relax and let my hair down, you know, which it wasn't a compliment always, you know. Um, 
Yeah, I, uh, I guess my um, interests, um, uh, when I say my education uh, was through the, the newspaper, through the series of conversations that happened, um, I began, I suppose, to um, maybe critically engage, you know, quietly, critically understand that the conversations that were happening um, locally um, didn't really exhaust the possibilities. I always had a sense that we, uh, that, that one of the, the hidden consequences of the conflict was a, a fixation on, okay, very genuine uh, uh, imperative issues of the day for local communities. But we, that, that, that there, there was a, a series of blind spots emerged as well, and especially around uh, um, the, uh, I guess, the limitations of the, the spiritual and the disconnect between the spiritual and the political uh, that was happening on the ground um, in my own community. So I, I remember having very interesting conversations with one or two of the parish priests in Craig and uh, talking about the the liberation theological tradition, the connections between ecology and theology and spirituality, and how these things are all connected. And uh, beginning to um, maybe explore how questions that were becoming very important internationally, especially the Green Movement um, and the, the, the new sense that spirituality um, was something that you could pursue uh, through meditation practices, um, through encounters with uh, the Zen tradition and other non-Christian traditions, and begin to use those to deepen one's inquiry, um, to address one's well-being in ways that weren't always um, apparent yeah. at the time in my own community, I suppose. But that, that's what I was going to ask you, you know, um now we find young parish priests and young ministers, and I assume young rabbis as well. And in fact, I interviewed a, a relatively young uh, minister a few a few weeks back. But you find that they they now deal with spirituality as part of that religious background, as opposed to something separate. That it that it's essential to understand that that wasn't always the case, as you know, within. Catholicism or any of the other organized religions, uh, quite often it was frowned upon. It was seen to be some kind of foreign body ejected into the the, the, the congregation. So you, you must have been, there must have been some quite interesting conversations, I would imagine. That's right. Yes. Um, I, I've, 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 <laughs> I remember um, standing outside my home in the, uh, in Craigan and the parish priest flying by in his lovely uh, new car, <laughs> um, shouting out the window in, in a very humorous way and very friendly way, but he'd be shouting uh, uh, at me <laughs> about my particular interests that uh, maybe was, were raising questions about the, the more parochial uh, concerns of the local parish. So I've had that rather unusual experience of the parish priest. Slagging me off. Been harangued by a party. <laughs> yeah, you know, harangued, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. University, was it, where was it, in Derry or in Belfast? Right. Well, I suppose the, uh, um, I don't want to dwell too much on the, the, the biography, but the uh, I uh, spent about eight years, seven or eight years as a, uh, a journalist. Um, and uh, when I, I was saying earlier that I, I just had a sense that the conversations that were happening locally, for all of their... Uh, uh, importance we're not really um, addressing or we're not picking up on some of the the global concerns yeah. that were beginning to interest me you know both in terms of spirituality politics and global movements like the the uh, 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 the peace movement for example so I I actually made a decision to go off to a monastery for three years I spent an incredible three years with the Tezi community. It's an international ecumenical monastic foundation founded by a Protestant uh, uh, brother, uh, Roger Schutz from uh, Switzerland. And it's a, a, an incredibly influential uh, community, both in terms of its liturgy. It's a very beautiful international multilingual 
uh, liturgy and a very contemplative uh, community where, which attracts tens of thousands of young people ac from across the world. Um, and it, it satisfied my need to go back to the, uh, the basics of uh, spirituality and faith um, in a way that were challenging because it wasn't simply about uh, bringing the, the traditions together. It was about how you enact one's faith. What are the, what are the consequences of accompanying those who are excluded? Um, what are the real questions for the European church after the, the deep divisions within Christianity? Um, and how do we accompany uh, those who are uh, most excluded, uh, right on the margins, who are suffering from the consequences of conflict? So that I spent three years as a co-worker, um, and I, I often describe it as living in a poem. You know, the rhythm of the liturgy combined with the encounters with young people from every corner of the world, um, and accompanying them um, in their own struggles. And the, the one thing that we all had in common was the question, how do we live a more authentic, committed life in struggle uh, alongside and uh, engaging with the most pressing issues of our day, informed by our faith and our, our spiritu spirituality? So I spent three years there before coming back to uh, study peace and conflict studies um, at McGee. Yeah, and I went on to do my postgraduate work at the University of Kent on international relations and politics. Having left that environment and returned to Derry at a time when 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 Ireland was in turmoil, in one shape, form, or other, while it was the the conflict in the north and all the stuff around the conflict, or the economic turmoil that was being created with the so-called Tiger economy in the south, the the liquidation or the dilution of values, all of that's going on around you. You're a young man. Uh, I can I can see from looking at your eyes, you were you are and were really inspired by this this uh, this experience. Was there an element of uh, I want to see if Darry and then the world was did that come into your you know were you were you almost an evangelical environmentalists um i guess i mean some people might see me in those terms and those are descriptions that i would probably resist myself certainly the evangelical description i i, I I'm, I'm not a, a great fan of any evangelical or kind of you know any sense of certainty i think we always have to experiment to be a bit more modest about our, our worldview no matter how inspired it might be or how precious it might be um but yes, you're, you're right that uh, I left and I didn't leave at the same time. I had the option and uh, at the back of my mind was the possibility of staying with the community in a, in a, in a monastic uh, role. I have to say it's, a, it's a, an unusual monastic community because it's, uh, it's a deeply engaged and it's uh, only part of their lives are spent in, uh, 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 I suppose in the... Uh, traditional monastic garb. These brothers are out in the world doing stuff yeah, yeah. and exposing their, their, their lives. But I left, but I didn't leave in the same, in the sense that I was there to deepen my own response to my life in Derry and my uh, commitment. So you're right that my commitment was deepening, even though I was a little bit absent. Um, I was trying to uh, address some of these um, suspicions that the conversations, the even the, the, the modes of struggle um, were not quite what they could be. Um, and that, the, that in some ways, the, while the conflict was important and was naming very important issues, especially for the minority community as it, as it was then, um, although it was naming those issues and uh, they were being addressed in certain ways, I felt that there were other issues um, and other modes of struggle and thinking that uh, I needed to investigate. So it was, it, it, it was really a, a, another life of inquiry that I pursued um, with a view to deepening my own commitment to my, my own community. So you're correct in the sense that um, I, I was, it was very much a part of my response to my formation in, in, uh, to the, in, in the life in, in Craig and all right. Yeah. 
So, so moving on through that, um, this, this inquiring mind happens to be really within the institutions which have suffocated that 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 view of investigation and looking for alternatives. How difficult was that for you? I mean, were you kind of a getting through it with a view to doing other greater, better stuff at the other end? Yeah, well, I suppose my, um, one of the, the uh, uh, interests that really matured uh, in Tasey, alongside my uh, now much more, I suppose, intimate knowledge of uh, struggles in other parts of the world, clinical struggles and divisions, and how young people were responding to them, um, I decided that one of the uh, contributions that I would make on returning to uh, the North would be to um, uh, I suppose help found the, the Green Party. Yeah. Um, and a particular, I have a particular vision of Green politics that is informed by my, uh, I suppose, my meetings with the German Greens, especially some of the founding members, uh, people like Petra Kelly, um, who were very much off the left, the new social movements who you know, were feminists, uh, third world solidarity people, people who were um, also deeply involved in the anti-nuclear uh, movement. They were really a coalition of critical social movements. Um, it was often said that Petra, you know, she, she was as acquainted with Das Kapital and Marx as she was with any of the new green political yeah. literature. So the, actually the first thing I did, literally when I left Tese, was go off to uh, Scandinavia, I did a short tour of uh, Scandinavian peace research institutions, but also attended the, the uh, Green Party, International Green Party uh, conference that year and got to uh, see Petra Kelly in full flight and then came home and uh, for the next, uh, uh, it must have been at least 10 or 15 years, I think the, the Green Party was probably no more than maybe a dozen activists or less in my, in my early uh, days. Um, and uh, it was certainly, uh, the uh, idea was to try to imagine a new political uh, platform that would take on board some of these uh, new conversations that were emerging in different parts of the world and see how they would look uh, in our own uh, situation and be relevant to our own Irish politics. Uh, I think that's still a project um, that has to emerge. That what, what does an Irish political ecology look like? Um, one that's not imported, that's not just borrowing, uh, you know, from the, the British Green Party experience or even the the European Green Party experience. I think there's a distinctive contribution to be made by inserting the uh, the Green Party ethos and the Green uh, critique uh, within our own uh, neck of the woods, if you like. Patrick Kelly, just uh, as a matter of interest for you, was one of the, the first politicians, if I can call her, I know she's deceased, if I can call her a politician, who adopted and supported the Irish hunger strike and she done it in a way that was very courageous, and she done it in a way that that obviously drew that awareness uh, about what was happening in Ireland. And so, forever grateful for for all of that. Another person I don't know why you ever came across a a Belfast ecologist called uh, Peter Emerson. Oh yes, I know uh, Peter very well. Peter Emerson, yeah. of course, yeah. Uh, yeah. pacifist and and very much opposed to physical force republicanism but very much in support of the, the hunger strikers. So you, you mentioned and you say uh, founder member of, or active founder member of the Greens. Was that, was that feeling that a we, we have now a vehicle by which we can raise these issues, which, which parties and all parties, I have to say, were either ignored or ill-informed. Was that kind of like a, Another phase of your of your uh, battle to have these issues effectively recognised as something that had to be addressed. Yes, um, 
I've always, well, I guess personally, I, I needed a, a platform that was internationalist, um, that understood that the that liberation struggles um, must take abo on board um, political ecology. That uh, e the ecological struggle is uh, intrinsic to our um, emerging understandings of what liberation and, and freedom and justice uh, mean. In the, in the in the in the in this world that's really moving beyond uh, the kind of the, the the legacy of the West built on its imperial um, uh, damage and uh, violence, if you like, not only to nature, but the damage uh, that it has done to our political imaginations and our cultural imaginations. Um, so I needed that platform that was internationalist um, that saw ecology as part of a, a, libera a new liberation narrative um, and that would complement my academic work um, bringing these issues together as well. I mean, I was in, uh, Petra Kelly talked about political spirituality as well. You know, she was someone who saw that the Green Movement is quite a prophetic movement and it's not limited to the, the party, of course. It's part of a, a wider, the, the biggest social movement in the world, actually. Um, that is reframing not only the answers but the questions that we are asking of ourselves as uh, as political subjects. So, in the Greens, you're active there. How does that? You know, and then we, we eventually get, or you eventually get to Queens in Belfast. So, how, what was that curve? How did that get you there? Um, well, I was. Uh, I, I pursued my um, academic studies uh, as a mature student, um, uh, peace and conflict studies, and then on to uh, international relations and political ecology. That was my PhD in uh, Kent. Um, and I was a very active member of the, the Green Party during that period, um, and also I was politically active on a number of issues um, in uh, Derry and the Northwest, um, issues around incineration. We've had a very successful series of campaigns against incineration. But in Derry, we don't simply say no to something. We offer something um, in return. And so we were very early advocates of uh, the need to not only say no, but to imagine what we put in its place. Yeah. So we campaign for jobs in the social economy around recycling, and more recently have uh, 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 successfully worked with the local authority on a uh, circular economy strategy. I've also was very deeply involved in the campaign on Raytheon, the arms company, yeah. and ethical investment. And again, not simply saying, well, we don't want that, but we, this is what we do want. We want an ethical economy. We want uh, an economy that emerges from addressing the questions around ethics and uh, ecological responsibility. So we advocated for a new economy and uh, got rid of Raytheon eventually. Yeah, yeah. Um, I got the local authority, you know, to be to have to be fair and with the support of uh, um, uh, Sinn Fein and the SDLP, we managed to uh, get the council itself to commit uh, to uh, forego um, investment offers from the arms trade in future, or you know, to forswear that uh, kind of investment. Um, so those are the kinds of campaigns that, that I've uh, invested quite a bit of energy in, also in fair trade and uh, local sustainability. Uh, these have been quite formative over the past uh, uh, 20 years as well. The, uh the the stuffiness, if you don't mind me saying that, with with queens or with that formal title, you are you're a lecturer. You're a very accomplished lecturer. You're very well known. You're an author, uh, as well as your political activity. You know your political campaign and all of that. Was there was there a contradiction? Was it a difficult kind of lane to balance between what's expected of you as a, a rather somber lecturer? And also an imaginative campaigner was that was that a, a balanced act that was hard to achieve? 
Um, no, no, I, I wouldn't say so. I, uh, um, I have, uh, I've always found colleagues, as long as your inquiry is intellectually rigorous, um, you know, Queen's is a, is a good place to be. In the law school, I've always found my colleagues deeply respectful of my intellectual journey. Um, and I enjoy, especially working with the, uh, the students who show an interest. And I think there's a, a growing appetite among the students in particular no, for absolutely. answers that are outside the usual box. Yeah. Um, you know, even, you know, the one thing I would say is that I guess both within the law school and within Northern Ireland society, there is a, a tendency to conflate um, progressive politics with uh, the human rights box. And I would say, yeah, that's a good starting point. It's, it's the, the safety net, if you like, and it's certainly in a post-conflict society um, uh, you know, uh, essential. But I, I think our radicalism can be a bit limited sometimes. We're not asking some of the important questions around uh, social inequality. There's too much of a tendency to conflate equal, the equality agenda with the agenda about the two communities. Um, and I think also that we need to begin to think about not only human rights, but the, the rights of nature. You know, one of the legacies of the Imperial Western project is that we have um, adopted a vision of nature as dead matter. We've translated nature into a series of objects. We, we see ourselves as the only uh, lively subjects or, or beings on a dead planet. You know, we're manipulating controlling objects, things, things to buy, things to transact. And I think um, we forget, you know, those of us who see ourselves as part of an anti-colonial tradition, we forget that there are questions around our subjection and the violence we've done to nature that we have to address. And thankfully in Ireland, you know, there are cultural, uh, even in, our, in, in the language, there's, there are traditions that we can appeal to, but have been absent from the liberation narratives, uh, even within uh, Sinn Féin and within the Republican tradition. I think we need to recover a much wider, more global uh, notion of what liberation means, especially for nature, to recognize that there are subjects, intentions, and even languages that, that occur all around us with which we interact and interdepend and interbe. Um, and I, that, that's one of the reasons that I uh, did a, a blog last year calling for um, a possible uh, constitutional amendment in the, uh, in the South, uh, maybe extending the idea of rights to the rights of nature as part of our journey towards liberating the island uh, from the, uh, the, the, the legacies of empire and the, 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 the violence that the, the West has done to our uh, notions of nature. And that takes me in really to the to the, the certainly the spirit of the book, uh, and just the look at where that's at. You came from what is a momentous journey in terms of, for instance, where where the whole green ecology issue was seen very much as cranky, as as something that was really a wee bit zany, a wee bit all of that. To what now is the conversation that every eighteen year old has. Uh, or, or those that don't have it should be having it in terms of the environment, in terms of uh, how life is valued, how people's, uh, how the creation of family units and that, that whole kind of spiritual cohesion uh, are really now for some up for grabs. They're, they're nothing more than a commodity for, for some. But it must have been very heartening for, for you uh, to watch this movement nearly instantaneously grow to a global that you know that that greens and green issues are to be found everywhere now uh, so you know well done i have to say for those who fought that battle because very often and, I, and i've been involved in politics for over 40 years very often it was a lonely battle you you were marginalized you were kind of laughed at sneered at and all of that so the book, so tell me, tell me how you arrived. I know you had been writing pamphlets. I know you had been contributing to some of the green material. And, and you were, of course, as you're, it's part of your job, you were writing. 
writing uh, papers. So how did the book, what inspired or where did the inspiration for the book spring on you? Yeah, well, I guess the, the book is really um, a kind of a, a new articulation of what, uh, of the, the program or the agenda uh, that uh, people like Patrick Kelly anticipated when she talks about political spirituality. And I guess one way to um, begin to uh, explain this is that the Fridays for Future, you know, the, 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 the Greta Thunberg Extinction Rebellion, the, the new moment in ecological struggle um, is really defined by an under, a deep understanding that the environmental crises, and they're, they're multiple actually, you know, yeah. they're, they're so climate change is just one, but there's yeah. uh, species yeah. extinction and all the rest of it, that they cannot be addressed as environmental issues. They will never be solved by simply giving a strong mandate to the Department of the Environment. They'll never be solved by simply strengthening environmental laws. The, eco the multiple ecological crises are symptoms, deep, deep symptoms of uh, uh, a design error, if you like, or a design flaw in our social, political, and especially our economic systems. So one of the things that I've tried to do in the book is to bring together um, uh, two, uh, an understanding of two uh, major uh, and quite influential uh, movements uh, with, with potential critical um, contributions to make to our response to the ecological crisis as a, a crisis in the system, if you like, right? One that is uh, raising questions for our individual lives, how we are in the world, as well as how we organize ourselves politically. So the narrative uh, that is really the subtext of the, the book is the narrative around the commons. You need to tell us the title of the book. Yeah, <laughs> it's a, a political economy of attention. Yeah. And, uh, I know you're reluctant to promote it, but you know, yeah, let's, let's yeah. recommend it. <laughs> the title's so long I can never remember it. Um, it's a political economy of attention, consumerism, uh, mindfulness, and uh, attention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, to take you to, to the, 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 the beginning, really, the, the, uh, the book reflects, first of all, my interest in the contemplative and uh, meditation traditions and mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And I, my, my own practice really is formed by uh, my engagement with the, the Zen tradition, uh, both the Vietnamese and, and Japanese traditions. But the, the narrative of the book really is about the, uh, the history of um, our system, our political and economic system, which is really about the, a series of enclosures of the commons. So you'll remember or you'll have read about the, 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 the enclosure of the forests and the lands in England yeah. and the privatization of uh, nature, the exclusion of people, and really the translation of these natural open systems, these open resources, uh, the, their translation into a series of uh, um, objects or commodities um, that have uh, been the subject of accumulation and, and, and you know, really the exclusion of uh, the majority. So I'm interested in the, uh, the history of the enclosures that began with the forests, the land, and then when people were expelled from the land, uh, they became laborers in the towns and cities and became, uh, uh, I suppose, instruments for the takeoff of the Industrial Revolution. So in many ways, our bodies, and this is what the trade unions are yeah. designed to do, they, they are addressing the enclosure of the body, our reduction to life as laborer, and with all the, pre the precariousness and the exploitation that went with that. Okay, so you've got the enclosure of nature, then with the Industrial Revolution, the enclosure of the body, and then the, uh, with the takeoff of the, of the Industrial Revolution, you have advanced capitalism, 
and consumerism and the enclosure of our imaginations. Yeah, and the spirit. Yeah. Mm. And in many ways, we, we tend to think about consumption um, as the end product of uh, production and the dissemination of goods and services. But actually, in our very sophisticated late capitalist system, which uh, controls um, forms of communication, advertising, social media, video games, all the rest of it, the, 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 late, the latest stage of enclosure, if you like, um, has impacted on our imaginations, our political imaginations, our sense of what's possible. That's why we have this uh, uh, phrase in the, the global social movement, another world is possible. Why do we have to produce a bit of rhetoric around that phrase? Because we're, many of us, uh, as consumers, consumers of very limited news agendas, uh, maybe addictions to one form of media or another, the idea that another kind of world is possible is not obvious. It's no longer obvious. Mm. So the book is about the enclosure movement insofar as it has extended now to our political imaginations, our political possibilities, the need to reopen uh, possibilities for a different kind of world and a different kind of way of being in the world. This is why we, we're, we're talking about moving beyond our lives as consumers, including the consumers of the dreams that come through the media, often very pacifying dreams. Um, and part of this political struggle is no longer to resist and overcome uh, late capitalist forms of neoliberalism, it's to pay attention to the impact that that enclosure of our imaginations has on our own well-being and our own potential as active uh, citizens and effective agents of change. And this is where paying attention to ourselves, um, our mental well-being, our physical well-being, and how we dispose or use our attention. Where, where do we spend our time? Where do we get our ideas from? Are we critically engaged with these uh, forms of media? And do we um, live as if another world is possible? So that's what the attention economy is about. It's where the possibilities of change meet our um, notions of well-being and the possibilities for uh, living lives much more, in a much more liberating way, uh, both as individuals and communities. And much of that is about moving beyond the consumerist uh, lifestyle and the, the compensations that capitalism offers for that rather empty life uh, that uh, has resulted from the, the colonization of our bodies and minds by the capitalist system. In a much more, a much more productive way, as well, in much more valued way, and yeah. and the book points out, and I would recommend the book to anyone. The book points out, and to everyone, the book points out. I suppose that ultimately the the object is that that the spirit, the mind, the hope, the aspirations become something else to package, to sell, and to buy or to exchange. So, I mean, I think the book's excellent, and. And a lot of the stuff that you're saying, when I was researching for our interview here, uh, and you had recommended the book, a lot of it is so obvious when you see it in print. A lot of it is is not the impossible. It's not something that is a, a pipe dream or or something that uh, films are made up. It's it's everyday experience. It's everyday life. So we're ten minutes left of this interview. Absolutely fascinating. Where do you see that that struggle today? Are we are we more advanced, or are we in a more difficult time? Do we have the green shoots of hope, or is it uh, doom and gloom and Donald Trump? Where 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 are we in all of this? Do, do you think? Yeah. Well, I I have a um, a sense that we are between worlds and that we all have choices to make about where we need to put our attention and our energy for change. Um, 
and I'm, I'm, I suppose I'm more hopeful uh, than pessimistic. I, uh, I see the, uh, the crises within a wider transition um, where what, I, mean, I think Trump and Brexit, for example, are symptoms of uh, the decline of a, uh, a Western project. Really, it's the, we're living in the, the last days of empire of uh, the last days of really what is a totalitarian system, really, when you think about yeah, the way yeah, yeah. capitalism has seized the instruments of state. Um, so we're at a, a dangerous moment, but an, also a moment of uh, opportunity. And if you listen carefully, um, if, you, um, if you have a sense of where uh, a much more liberating and uh, enjoyable future uh, might emerge. You'll hear lots of conversations here in Belfast and other parts of Ireland, across the island, uh, where the, the, the new possibilities are part of the daily conversation, especially uh, um, the sense that the, the, the new economic structures are not fit for purpose. I'm sorry, that the, that the there are the, there are new economic structures possible, and that the current structures are clearly exhausted. So there's a, a new uh, emergence of uh, interest in uh, the sharing economy, the cooperative economy, uh, often emerging with ecological as well as well as ethical interests. Um, people moving out of the uh, consumerist and, the, and sometimes. Uh, cutting back on uh, work, working hours to maybe to, yeah. to do some more uh, uh, self provisioning as well. So th there are lots of signs of hope if you listen carefully, but it's often hidden. Um, it's not given the visibility um, that it deserves, especially by our local media. Um, and sometimes I have to say it's also suppressed by the rather uh, well, what passes for politics at times, it's almost a, it's, it's like a caricature. I think we're sometimes uh, a little bit behind the curve when it comes to the political parties. But in the undergrowth, um, the, there are lots of liberating possibilities taking root. And they would, I think it would do well for the political parties to, to listen to some of those debates about uh, well-being. But well-being in terms of uh, moving beyond the growth model, moving beyond GDP as the single uh, false yeah. register of our well-being, yeah. Yeah. Um, and also movements uh, towards a politics and economics of care. You know, valuing those who, uh, either in the home or in the public sector, are um, offering care and attention and uh, support to those who are vulnerable or, or sick. But there's a, a wider feminist and eco-feminist uh, politics of care that is also about restoring uh, a sense of uh, uh, a more intimate connection, um, valuing the connection we have with others, um, with nature, um, and developing an economy that rewards and supports those connections, those meaningful connections that we have. And I think what's what's hopeful as well of course is that none of this as you say is news to us we we know this um, we know what's valuable communities of struggle know uh in their heart of hearts that uh consumerism is not where this struggle is going to we 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 know about the economy of regard and support and solidarity but we sometimes don't always uh um we don't always take that to its obvious conclusion in understanding that liberation struggles today have a deep ecological caring dimension that needs to be imported even into some of our party politics. No, no, I, I absolutely agree with you. And I think that I think that those political parties across the, the board, nationally and internationally, that don't understand that liberation struggle is not geographical, that it is spiritual, that is that is to do with how we plot Kominsky said recently that those who don't change will wither. They will wither. And I, the last question I want to ask you, 
and this is very unfair, but I, but I want to ask you it anyway, and you wouldn't have it any other way. Absolutely. Do you see? Do you see sections of our community? I'm thinking particularly young people uh, and women, those who, who you talk about being marginalised socially, economically, culturally marginalised. Do you see within them a hope of change for us all? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think we're at a very interesting moment um, in the politics of the of the north and across the island, um, and especially the uh, the new coalitions that are forming, um, because those coalitions are more likely uh, to move away from this, the old certainties. Um, I you know I, I've always liked the uh, the definition of uh, sectarianism that comes from uh, Paulo uh, Freire and he talks about moving in our own circles of certainty um, and I think we're all you know we're, we're all uh, uh, vulnerable to that possibility that we that we have our own bubbles um, so the, the new coalitions the the greens the women's movement um, the uh, the young people who have a more cosmopolitan uh, sense of where we live and also a, a sense of wanting to re-inhabit the earth in a way that is informed by care, by justice and solidarity with people who um, live in the most desperate of circumstances. And we are living with the, uh, the fatal consequences of climate yeah, change today, absolutely. even like uh, the future, you know. Absolutely. So people who have that sensitivity are emerging and finding ways to become politically or active in their community. And they are a great uh, source of hope. And the world is full. It's a very rich world the, today in terms of uh, platforms for those for those new ideas. And the more uh, they are um, embraced locally and inform our local politics and ways of living, uh, the more hopeful I am. And I, I don't I never lose that hope. On those words of wisdom, we've came to the end of our time. I'd like I'd like you to come back on the show, and I'd like you to come back on where we can kind of way give the practical examples where that desire for change is manifesting itself. For instance, if we look at Black Lives Matter, it's clear that what's at play there is more than racial equality. It is the quality of life that's at play and all of that. So if you haven't been um, turned off by this interview, okay. uh, I want to extend an invitation and, and we'll come back. So my guest today, is Peter Dorn. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your insight. And can I commend the book to those who want to look and see what we what we need to do and how we need to get there. So Peter, thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, Joe. Thank you very much.